Shalom Harav Arnix. Welcome to our next session in the First Regathering, Zionism and the Modern State of Israel. We're in session number six, dealing with the rise of Zionism. All right, let's go ahead and take a review, quick look at where we've been in previous sessions. We started out this class in Roman numeral one, the spiritual war. This was an introductory material to the class. We moved to paragraph, or Roman numeral number two, excuse me, a look at the background, a look at the, at, a historic, at the historical period of 66 AD to 1839 AD, the historical background of Zionism. We saw that the period was noted, ca categorized by continuous Jewish presence in the land. From 66 AD to 634 AD was the Roman period. The temple was destroyed in 70 AD during the first Jew uh, Jewish revolt. Uh, then in 135 AD, the temple was again destroyed under the Bar Kokhba revolt and the Jewish people were scattered all over the world. At that time, the Roman Empire continued to grow. It uh, broke into two divisions right along this line. It became the Eastern Roman Empire and the Western Roman Empire. And Israel was just a small province in the Eastern Roman Empire. The capital of the Eastern Roman Empire was Byzantium, Byzantium located here. From 634 to 1099 was the Arab period. The uh, advance of Islam began in 634 AD, coming out of the Arabian Peninsula. Soon Islam had moved from the Arabian Peninsula, conquering to the east, conquering to the west, uh, moving across the top of uh, Northern Africa, of course Northern Africa, up into Spain, to the very borders of France. At that time, Jewish people lived in Lydda, Ramla, Ashkelon, Caesarea, Gaza, and there were some Jewish people living in Jerusalem, but there was Jewish presence in the land. The Masoretic text was developed at that time, and the Karaite uh, branch of Judaism developed in, during this period. Then came 1099 to 1291, the Latin Kingdom of Jerusalem, the Crusader period, and here was a cru the Crusader Kingdom in this area. From 1291 to 1516 was the period of the Mamluks. From 1517 to 1917, the period of the Ottoman Empire. And uh, Jerusalem was just an independent Sanjak within Ottoman administrative divisions. This is the independent Sanjak of Jerusalem. Basically, it is Judea and the Negev. And then uh, Galilee is the Sanjak of Balka, Accra, and Beirut. So the point is, there's no Palestinian state there. In fact, there's no, and uh, this area never was an independent state unless it was under the Jewish people. It just became, a, the area just became various uh, provinces of different rulers. Now during that time Safed was the center of Jewish population and learning. Uh, Joseph Karo lived in Safed and he wrote the Shulchan Aruch which was designed to guide Jewish life. Isaac Luria was uh, uh, active during this period. He promoted the Zohar. And the Ottoman Empire eventually shrank by 1914. It consisted basically of Arabia and Turkey. And then by 1923, it had been reduced simply down to the area of Turkey. So we finished up the spiritual war. Then we finished up Roman numeral two, the background, the historical survey of the period. Then we leaped into Roman number, Roman number three, Roman numeral number three, uh, dealing with the end of exile. 1839 to 1947, and the modern Zionist movement. We saw that two branches of Zionism would begin the movement, religious Zionism and secular Zionism. Religious Zionism's uh, philosophy and motivating factor was redemption. This was promoted by Rabbi Judah Alkali and Rabbi Zvi Hirsch Kalisher. On the other side of the coin, secular Zionism was motivated by anti-Semitism. This was promoted by Moses Hess and by Leo Pinsker. So we began with a look at the life of Judah Alkali, Re uh, Reverend Rabbi Judah Alkali, and also Rabbi Zvi Hirsch Kalisher. In 1856, Hayeshuv Hayeshan, the old settlement, was underway. Here's a picture of Jews living in Jerusalem during the old Yeshuv. They lived, most of them lived in poverty, and so the Chalukah 
charity system began uh, functioning at that time. <clears throat> so we looked at religious Zionism. Then our attention moved to secular Zionism with its focus on anti-Semitism. And we saw that Moses Hess uh, taught that our physical existence was at stake. And then Leo Pinsker will teach what they fear, they, what people fear they hate. And that, of course, is Leo Pinsker's understanding of the reasons behind anti-Semitism. So we looked at the life of Moses Hess in 1862. We saw that in 1869, Joel Moish Solomon and six friends went outside the old city of Jerusalem and purchased a tract of land they called Nachalat Shiva, the first independent tract of land purchased, self-financed by Jewish people outside the old city, Nachalat Shiva, the plot of the seven. In 1870, uh, Mikveh Yisrael was founded there on the coast, Mikveh Yisrael, farming community. In the late 1870s, the Chovevitzion groups were functioning by the hundreds in Russia. Their credo, there's no salvation for the people of Israel unless they establish a government of their own in the land of Israel. In 1874, Mea Sharim, 100 Gates, was purchased. Uh, there's Nachalat Shiva, again the old city, and just north of Nachalat Shia, Mea Sharim was purchased, the second independent um, territory outside the old city. 1878, Petach Tikva was founded, again by Joel Moish Solomon. There's Petach Tikva in its approximate location on a map of modern Israel. And then in 1881, a very significant event, an extremely significant event, 1881, Eliezer ben Yehuda arrives in Israel. Eliezer ben Yehuda was a philologist. He um, studied languages. He felt that uh, the language of the nation was as important as the blood, sweat, and tears poured into the nation, and he was right. During his career, he finished four volumes of uh, what turned out to be, I believe, a 17-volume dictionary of ancient and modern Hebrew. Uh, an amazing work of scholarship. It is available even today uh, at, am at Amazon.com for the paltry sum of $850. You can get it, but uh, it's due to Eliezer ben Yehuda that we now have a modern Hebrew language. And you can read about his life in the book Tongue of the Prophets by Robert St. John. I recommend this highly. He had a very interesting life. All right, that brings us now to the new material. And we were going to pick it up in 1882 with Leo, Leon Pinsker, <coughs> publishing Auto Emancipation. Now, one year after Ben Yehuda and his wife arrived in Israel and began their years of poverty, another significant Zionist appeared on the scene, and that was Leo Pinsker. Pinsker was the son of an enlightened family in Odessa, Russia, now the Ukraine. Here you can see a picture of the Ukraine, surrounded by Romania, Bulgaria, the Black Sea, Russia, and Georgia. And here is Odessa, a seaport on the Black Sea. And here's a focus on the borders of the Ukraine. It was called Russia in those days. It was a province of Russia. And again, that very, very important city in uh, Zionism, o Odessa, a seaport on the Black Sea. That name Odessa will keep prop, cro uh, cropping up again and again and again throughout our class. You see, Odessa was the nerve center of mid-19th century Haskalah. Now, what's Haskalah? Haskalah was a secular assimilationist philosophy. Now, in the 1860s, Pinsker's vision of a Jewish future was consistent with Haskalah. It was one of cultural self-expression within pluralistic Russia. So there was no need for a Jewish state in his mind in the beginning. However, in 1871, an anti-Jewish outbreak briefly exploded in Odessa. Deeply unsettled by the episode, Pinsker withdrew from all Jewish public activities for the next seven years and brooded over the evident failure of his cherished dream of enlightenment. Of enlightenment. Eventually, he organized his views in writing and published a lengthy essay in 1882 entitled Auto-Emancipation, a call to the Jewish a call to his people by a Russian Jew, and it is available on Amazon.com if you are interested in uh, reading it, and I believe you can also read it on the Jewish Virtual Library. Now, in his work, in his work, Pinsker outlined his central idea: normal dealings between peoples were founded on mutual respect, not love, and it was unlikely that the, the Jews could ever be ac accorded such respect because they lacked its prerequisite of national. Equality, he wrote, the Jewish people has no fatherland of its own. 
no center of gravity, no government of its own, no official representation. Rather, he said, the Jews were perceived as kind of a phantom people, bearing many of the characteristics of nationhood without the final indispensable ingredient of a land of their own. He said, there is something unnatural about a people without a territory, just as there is about a man without a shadow. Worse yet, as a phantom people, the Jews inspired fear among the non-Jewish majority, and whatever people feared, they hated. That was his understanding, his explanation of anti-Semitism. The solution to the Jewish con uh, condition, Pinsker insisted, was not uh, a reliance upon uncertain emancipation, but on a concerted attempt by the Jews to utilize their waning moment of opportunity to restore a national home of their own. Pinsker attached no special importance to the land. He said the piece of land might form a small territory in North America or a sovereign pashalik in Asiatic Turkey. What counted, what, what was most important was recognized nationhood on a land, any land, didn't matter where. So until Pinsker, the vulnerability of the Jews as a homeless people had never been demonstrated quite so systematically. For the first time, Jew hatred was analyzed as a deeply complex social phenomenon. It's viewed, and even today, anti-Semitism is viewed as a social phenomenon bearing little relationship to education or progress in the conventional terms. Well, anti-Semitism is uh, inconceivable in, in contemporary terms. It doesn't make a lot of sense in contemporary terms. And the problem is you're looking at the surface expression, not the root cause. If you think um, anti-Semitism is a deeply complex social phenomenon, you're looking at the surface expression, not the root cause, which is spiritual warfare. You see, uh, God has made a covenant with the Jewish people called the Abrahamic Covenant. It consists of three basic promises, the land promise, a nation promise, and a spiritual blessing promise. A land, the land of Israel, nation, people to, a nation promise, people to live in that land, and spiritual blessing, salvation, uh, to come to those people. Now, Satan, the accuser, knows that when the Abrahamic covenant gets fulfilled in its entirety, his career is over because he is a, re a rebel against God. And so he tries to attack the Abrahamic covenant. He can't attack God directly, so he attacks what's important to God. See, if the Abrahamic covenant is broken or perverted, that proves that God is not holy, that God is not all-powerful, that not, God is not good, he does not keep his promises. So Satan, and that makes means that Satan's career is safe. God can't uh, finish the Abrahamic covenant. He will not move to destroy Satan. So Satan tried to attack the Abrahamic covenant at the spiritual blessing promise with the Messiah, coming of the Messiah, and that actually fulfilled the spiritual blessing promise. With Messiah on the cross, the spiritual blessings were fulfilled and are available to the whole world now. So that failed. So that leaves Satan with two legs of the Abrahamic covenant to attack, the land promise. That's the land of Israel. And so even today he is trying to prevent the, the um, nation of Israel from being in existence. He tried to prevent its, its reformation in, uh, through Zionism, and he is now trying to destroy it in our modern day uh, with the unrelenting attack by the Palestinian peoples, so the Palestinian Authority and Hamas upon Israel, trying to destroy the nation of Israel. That would destroy the land promise of the Abrahamic Covenant. Well, that's not succeeding. And then the nation promise, the people to live in that land, is the other leg that can be destroyed, and Satan has been trying to destroy the Jewish people from time immemorial. Uh, he tried the latest uh, attempt to destroy the Jewish people was the Holocaust of World War II. Ahead of us lies the Holocaust of the Tribulation. But anyway, that is the this is the root cause for anti-Semitism, Satan's war against God. He can't attack God directly, so he attacks what's important to God, and. Um, he knows that as soon as the Abrahamic Covenant is fulfilled, his career is over. He's trying desperately to save himself. This is why anti-Semitism has been so relentless, a relentless problem 
throughout thousands and thousands of years, throughout countless generations. It'll continue until the Abrahamic covenant is fulfilled, the Messianic kingdom is, is, is in place, and Satan is thrown into the lake of fire. All right, well, let's move on. Let's move back to Pinsker and auto-emancipation. Almost immediately after auto-emancipation was published, it evoked a responsive chord among its readers. Very quickly, Pinsker became one of the most admired men in Russian Jewry. For a while, he was the very heart of the Young Zionist movement. In 1884, Pinsker set about organizing his nondescript collection of followers into a national movement. His followers were that unorganized, unofficial, and illegal group of Zionist study circles and clubs known as the Chovevi Tzion. Pinsker, by virtue of his prestige and by virtue of the general recognition that he was the natural leader of the growing Zionist movement, took the initiative. He would bring organization and focus to the Chovevi Tzion groups in 1884. Now we come to the beginnings of the first Aliyah. Between 1882 and 1903, 25,000 Jewish people entered Palestine. This was the largest single influence since the Spanish Expulsion Decree of 1492. The upsurge of immigration was usually described as the first Aliyah, the first immigration wave. Now that term Aliyah comes from a Hebrew word that means to go up, going up. Why? That's because Jerusalem is located in the, in the Judean hills. And no matter from which direction you approach Jerusalem, north, south, east, or west, you are going up. You go up to Jerusalem and down from Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the focal point of the Jewish world. So Aliyah, to go up, to go up. This became a term describing immigration. So here's a picture of some of the pioneers of the first Aliyah, courageous, courageous people who uh, moved into Israel at this time. Now the first Aliyah consisted of, excuse me, let me uh, back this up here. And this first Aliyah consisted of two main waves, one from 1882 to 1884 and one from 1890 to 91. The first Aliyah immigrants came from Russia, and there are two main reasons. The first reason were the Russian pogroms of 1881, and here's my de definition of a pogrom. What is a pogrom? It's an organized persecution or extermination of an ethnic group, especially of Jewish people. So the renewed second reason was the renewed anti-Jewish policy of the Russian government as reflected in the May Laws published in 1882, May 1882. Now, the May Laws, the anti-Semitic May Laws, imposed new political restrictions and disabilities on the Jews of Russia and brought to an abrupt end the area, era of liberalism uh, under the pre preceding decade of Tsar Alexander II. Now, these new developments caused many Jews in Russia to despair, to despair of any hope of permanent improvement in the position of the Jews in Russia. The expulsion of the Jews from Moscow in 1891 provided a fresh impetus to Jewish immigration from Russia. It sent more Jews to Israel and thus completed the first Aliyah. The immigrants of the first Aliyah were, mo were mainly middle-class men, teachers, students, artisan, and tradesmen. Some of them had enough of their own means, enough money, to enable them to settle in the country. Many of the immigrants came under the influence of the Chovevitzion organizations. All but five of the new, newcomers, 95% of the newcomers, settled in the towns of Jerusalem, Jaffa, Hebron, and Haifa. At this time, it became evident to the unorganized Chovevitzion organizations, while attracting many followers, they were ineffective agencies for immigration. Now, this led to the formation of the Bilu. The Bilu is organized in Russia. It was a group of youthful idealists that decided to take the initiative in establishing a creative foothold on the land. In January of 1882, 30 young men and women gathered in Kharkov, Russia, in the lodgings of a university student, Israel Belkind, to discuss the plight of the nation. Now here's the Ukraine, known as Russia, and uh, to the eastern part of the, uh, of the uh, Ukraine is the city of Kharkov, the city of Kharkov. Now, they formed an immigration society known as the Bilu, 
a Hebrew Bible acrostic for House of Jacob. Let us go up. Beth, Ye Beth Yaakov, Lachu, Vanelcha. House of Jacob, let us go up. The Bilu, this is their charter. This is their handwritten charter. 1882. Now, 19 of the youths uh, made a commitment to abandon their studies or professions and in favor of immediate departure for the land of Israel. The others would recruit new, new members to establish a model agricultural colony in Israel. In July of 1882, they shifted their headquarters from Kharkov, Russia, to Odessa, Russia. Again, from Kharkov to that very, very important seaport on the Black Sea, Odessa. Odessa. Odessa is a very important city in Zionism. By the end of 1882, 17 members of the group sailed for Constantinople. From there, an advance guard of 13 men and one woman sailed for Israel, reaching Jaffa five days later. Intent upon securing at least a minimum of agricultural experience before launching a farm of their own, the young pioneers eventually received their first opportunity at Mikveh Yisrael, a training school established 12 years earlier by the Alliance. Remember that? The French te teachers evidenced no sympathy for their ideals. The Biluites were driven mercil mercilessly in their fieldwork, 11 to 12 hours a day, until they neared collapse. One of them wrote, The overseers kept pressing us, giving us not a moment's rest. They had been instructed to drive this spirit of folly out of us and compel us to leave. Well, what is the spirit of folly? The spirit of folly is this desire to have an independent agricultural community. The, um, the, um, uh, the uh, uh, alliance, the alliance did not, was not in favor of an independent uh, agricultural community. So in the summer of 1882, the Biluites had little reason to be optimistic. Sickness was undermining their will to go on. They had no funds to enable them to de develop a model colony of their own. And here's a picture of the Biluim. They're the, really the forerunners of the kibbutz movement. Again, brave young men and women. Rishon LeZion is founded. Almost at the last minute, minute, hope materialized in the form of two Jerusalem Jews, Zalman Leventon and Joseph Feinberg. During the previous year, these men had traveled, this, excuse me, these men had collected money for land purchase from investors in Jerusalem and in Europe. So with that money, they managed to acquire a hundred acre of a hundred acre tract of land eight miles inland from Jaffa. They erected their shacks there and they dubbed the, dubbed the new settlement Rishon Litzion, first to Zion. And there's the approximate location of Rishon Litzion. Now at this point, Touched by the plight of the Biluites, Leventon and Feinberg persuaded the others to allow the youngsters to join their venture. Immediately, 11 of the Biluites took up shelter they, in a makeshift dormitory that was set aside for their use, and pooling their last resources, they cleared the soil and planted maize and vegetables. Unfortunately, the harvest season was past. After two months, both food and money were exhausted, and Roshon Litzion faced the very real threat of starvation. Completely dispirited, five of the original pioneer group decided to return to Mikveh Yisrael and six to Russia. At the same time, Petach Tikva, which had been abandoned several years earlier, was being resettled by newcomers from Europe. And they fared no better than Roshon Zion. Disease, heat, exhaustion, and robbery sapped their will and resources. Jewish settlers were preparing to abandon an evidently hopeless cause. 1883, we come to the be beginning of Baron Edmund Rothschild's help of Jewish settlements. Their rescue came from a very unanticipated source, Baron Edmund de Rothschild. And here's a picture of Bar uh, Baron Rothschild. In the autumn of 1882, he granted an audience to Joseph Feinberg, one of the two founders of Rishon Zion. Feinberg had gone to Europe in a desperate fundraising effort to save his colony. Rothschild, a rich and eminent banker, was moved to tears by Feinberg's account of the pioneer's self-sacrifice. Immediately, he offered 30,000 francs for the purpose of drilling a well 
at Rishon LeZion, and he implied that additional help would soon be forthcoming. Soon after, Rothschild dispatched an expert French agronomist to Israel to instruct the Bilou farmers, and he hired the director of Mikveh Yisrael School as the overseer of Rishon LeZion. So here's Rishon LeZion in the 1890s, a few years later. It is surviving, Rishon LeZion in 1937. It's uh, grown even more. Rishon LeZion today, the original great synagogue and square of Rishon, Le, Rishon LeZion today. And from the air, you see that Rishon LeZion is a thriving community within Israel. In return for his help, Rothschild stipulated that his contributions not be made public. So his wish was honored by me, for, for many, many years. Somewhat cryptically, the settlers referred to their patron as Hanadiv Hayadua, the well-known benefactor. And in fact, Edmund Rothschild was buried in Israel. This is Ramat Hanadiv, Baron Edmund James, the Rothschild's final resting place. The heights of the benefactor, Ramat Hanadiv, referring to his desire to be anonymous. Beautiful resting place for him. Now, Petach Tikva also turned to Rothschilds for help. By 1888, 28 families relied on him for daily income. However, Rothschild's support was not a blank check for the colonists to just operate their farms according to their own judgment. The experts he sent from France and from Mikra Yisrael became his overseers, charged with the day-to-day -day administration of the settlements. Before long, a radical change took place in the farmers' plans, the farmers' status. Eventually, they were stripped of all authority to determine the crops that they might plant and to sell. It became the decision of the overseers. This kind of paternalism not only eroded the farmers' initiative, it undermined their morale as well. They resented their dependence upon the caprice of the overseers. Although well aware that they might, have, might starve without Rothschild's help, the colonists openly voiced bitterness against their transformation into serfs. Well, ni the nine Bilawites, continu continuing on at Rishon LeZion and Mikveh Isra Israel, were fully as despairing under Rothschild's supervision as they had been in their earlier, their hungrier days. 1884, Gadara is founded. Once again in the fall of 1884, an alternative solution developed unexpectedly. Yachiel Pines, a Russian Jew who had, who had immigrated to Israel in 1878, had brought with him a modest sum collected from the various Josevi Zion groups. With this and other borrowed funds, Pines had established a craftsman society for the Biluites in Jerusalem in 1882. Now, with the remainder of the money, he purchased 700 acres of land near Yavna, a few miles inland from the coast. The irony here, the irony of Israel, the irony of Zionism, is that we had to buy our own ha homeland back from Arab landlords. Isn't that ironic? So he purchased 700 acres of land near Yavna, and he turned it over to the Biluites. In December of 1884, their number reduced to eight. The Biluites set up a single wooden shack on the site. They called the farm Gadara. Gadara. You can see the location of Gadara in the, uh, in the square in the bottom right. Sheepfold, Gadara. Sheepfold, it was called. Now, in 1884, derived of access to Rothschild's experts, the Bilu youths misplanted their subsistence crops, and in the end, they were reduced to meals of radishes and potatoes. By the beginning of 1886, their situation was quite desperate. It appeared that Gadara would not survive. Well, Gadara did in fact survive, but it was only through the generosity of Baron Rothschild. The handful of, set of settlers that remained abandoned the notion of a cooperative community. Like the colonists of Rishon LeZion, uh, Petach Tikva, and other villages, they began to accept handouts from Paris and to hire cheap Arab labor, which, by the way, was uh, where the Palestinians came from. The uh, Jewish people provided economic opportunities, and the Arab, um, the Arab uh, uh, peoples came into the land and took advantage of these, these economic opportunities. And that is basically where the current Palestinian people came from. They were um, 
They were Arab peoples who migrated into the land due to uh, Jewish economic opportunity. Now, the original Beluites refused to endure this surrender. By the end of the 1880s, all of them had abandoned Gadara, some for the cities, some for Western Europe. Their experiment apparently had failed, but it did not. It did not. Here's Gadara in 1899. Gadara is growing. Here is Gadara today. Another picture of Gadara as it looks today. Thriving community in Israel. This is the Museum of the History of Gadara and the Bilu, located in Gadara, of course. And now we come to 1891 and William E. Blackstone, the first dean of the Bible Institute of Los Angeles, known as Biola today. William Eugene Blackstone was an American evangelist and Christian Zionist. He was the author of the proto-Zionist Blackstone Memorial of 1891. Blackstone was influenced by Dwight Moody, James H. Brooks, and John Nelson Darby. In 1878, he wrote, Jesus is Coming. His book became the veritable reference source of American dispensationalist thought. Over the next 50 years, Jesus is Coming sold multi-millions of copies worldwide and was translated into 48 languages. And you can get it at Amazon.com. He initially focused on the restoration of the Jews to the Holy Land as a prelude to their conversion to Christianity. He did this out of a pious wish to hasten the coming of the Messiah. But he increasingly became concerned with the deadly Russian government instigated pogroms, and he believed it was necessary to create a Jewish homeland in Palestine. Blackstone and his daughter traveled to the Holy Land in 1888. He returned convinced that a return of the Jewish people to its ancient homeland was the only possible solution to the person persecution Jews suffered elsewhere. On November 24th and 25th, 1890, Blackstone organized the Conference on the Past, Present, and Future of Israel in the First Methodist Episcopal Church in Chicago, where participants from both Jewish and Christian communities attended. The conference issued a call to the great powers, including the Ottoman Empire, to re return Palestine to the Jews. A year, a year later, in 1891, Blackstone led a petition drive that was approved by the conference. It was later known as the Blackstone Memorial. The memorial was signed by 413 prominent Christian and a few Jewish leaders in the United States. Blackstone personally gathered the signatures of such men as John D. Rockefeller, J.P. Morgan, two very influential and rich Americans, John Rockefeller, J.P. Morgan, uh, senators, congressmen, religious leaders of all denominations, newspaper editors, the Chief Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court, and others for the Blackstone Memorial. He pre presented the memorial to President Harrison. In March of 1891, calling for American support of Jewish restoration to Palestine, his, pe his petition paralleled the later ideas of Theodore Herzl. Herzl, whose establishment of modern Zionism was outlined in his book Der Judenstaat in 1896. The Blackstone Memorial read in part, Why shall not the powers, which under the Treaty of Berlin in 1878, gave Bulgaria to the Bulgarians and Serbia to the Serbs, now give Palestine back to the Jews? These provinces, as well as Romania, Montenegro, Greece were wrested from the Turks, that's the Ottoman Empire, and were given to their natural owners. Does not Palestine as rightfully belong to the Jews? So Blackstone, learning of the rise of the Zionist movement led by Theodor Herzl, Blackstone became an outspoken and ardent supporter of Zionism. When Herzlian Zionism considered the offer of the British government for an interim Jewish state in Uganda, Blackstone campaigned against it. He sent to Herzl a personal Bible outlined with the specific Bible references of Jewish restoration to Palestine only. The Bible was said to have been prominently displayed on Herzl's desk for many years. It is no longer locatable, unfortunately. Supreme Court Justice Louis D. Brandeis 
rediscovered the Blackstone Memorial in 1916. He sought and formed an alliance with Blackstone. Blackstone uh, Brandeis requested Blackstone issue a modern Blackstone Memorial to President Wilson. Brandeis understood the fundamentals of power politics and of grassroots American Christian and American political support. Brandeis under, understood that the support that Blackstone would raise for the memorial would enable President Wilson to accept and endorse American Zionism and later British, the British Balfour Declaration of 1917, which set the course of the establishment of the State of Israel. Although 75 years of age, Reverend Blackstone energetically undertook the strenuous project. Of particular note, Blackstone secured the endorsement of his memorial to President Wilson from the Presbyterian Church. President Wilson was a religiously observant Presbyterian. The memorial, though presented to President Wilson only privately, was very effective in garnering President Wilson's support and in turn reassuring the British of American support for the Balfour Declaration. While Blackstone remained committed to Jewish restoration and Zionism for the balance of his long life, as a believing evangelical Christian, he witnessed the fulfillment of biblical prophecy as the Jewish state came back to life after 1900 years. Blackstone died 13 years before the Jewish state of Israel was reborn in 1948, but without Reverend, Reverend Blackstone's lifelong efforts to build American political support and American prophetic understanding of dispensationalism and restorationism, American support of Zionism and the state of Israel might have been very different. Famous during his life, he slipped into historical obscurity. Reverend Blackstone died on November 7, 1935. He was buried in a modest grave in the Forest Lawn Seminary, Cemetery excuse me, in Glendale, California. All his evangelical life, Blackstone described himself as God's little errand boy. And here is the memorial to William E. Blackstone in um, Forest Lawn Cemetery in Glendale. Now, Reverend Blackstone may have had disappeared into obscure, historical obscurity in his, uh, in his later years, but he has not disappeared into historical obscurity in this class. You need to know about William Blackstone. Thank the Lord for William Blackstone and his commitment to the Jewish people and to Zionism. All right, let's move on to the Katowice Conference of Chibat Zion. It was apparent now that idealism, motivation, dedication to the Chovebi Zion groups were inadequate to bring about independent immigration to, to Israel. So at this point, Leo Pinsker took the initiative and summoned a national conference of the various Chovebi Zion societies. He circumvented Russian authorities and the meeting was therefore convened in Katowice, a German city. 34 delegates attended the initial gathering. And here are the Katowice Conference delegates. There are 26 pictured here of the 34 that actually attended. So you see Leo Pinsker is bringing organization and coherence to the Chovebizion groups. They reached a consensus the Katowice Conference delegates reached a consensus that financing Jewish settlement in the land was their first priority. Only in the land of Israel, it was agreed, could the people of Israel be transformed into a viable society and nation. The organization's central office was established, guess where? Yeah, you guessed it, Odessa. As president there of the Chovevi Zion, Pinsker was charged with directing a growing stream of Jewish immigrants to the Holy Land. In the 1890s, the Chovebi Zion grew rapidly in many parts of Europe and overseas. Dr. Nathan Birnbaum, Dr. Nathan Birnbaum, a leader in the movement, first coined the, time, the, the, the term Zionism. This is where the term Zionism came from, Dr. Birnbaum. Now, I want you to pay close attention to what I'm about to put up on the screen. Read it along with me as I read it. By the time Theodore Herzl appeared on the scene in the 1800s, he encountered in Europe and in America the nucleus of a thoroughly respectable Zionist movement. The foundation of a thoroughly respectable Zionist movement had been laid by God. Its various societies provided him with the largest number of his followers, including 90% of the delegates attending the first Zionist Congress of 1897. So when God brought Theodore Herzl on the scene, 
the foundation was prepared for him. You know, Herzl did not create the Jewish state. God created the Jewish state, and Herzl only had a small part in that creation. When he came on the scene, God had created the foundation using Rabbi Judah Alkali, using Zvi Hirsch Kalisher, uh, using Moses Hess and Joel Moish Solomon, the Chovevitzion and their credo, that there was no salvation for the people of Israel unless they established government of their own in the land of Israel. These people knew what was going on. Eliezer ben Yehuda reestablishing the language. Leo Pinsker in his efforts in Odessa. The pioneers, the brave pioneers of the first Aliyah and the brave Biluim who uh, went through such hardship. And then Baron Edmund James the Rothschild who used his financial resources to build the foundation. And William E. Blackstone who brought in American and uh, American Christian and political support to the to the Zionist cause. Yes, the, tr the foundation was laid. The launching pad was ready. And then God moved uh, Theodore Herzl onto the launching pad. Theodore Herzl did, did not just take off by himself. He did not just blast off by himself. And as you shall see, he really didn't accomplish that much either. Anyway, I, th I just think that Theodore Herzl receives far too much credit for the creation of the State of Israel. That's the point that we'll continue to see as we go through this class. All right, get off my, I'll get off my soapbox there and we will, um, we will look at 1889 and the B'nai Moshe founded by Achad Ha'am, so, ha some more of the foundation that God is going to put down before Herzl shows up on the scene. Okay, in 1889, the Zionist dream of a Jewish national home was very, very shaky. The crisis was perceived at the very outset, outset by Asher Ginsberg, a leading member of the Chovevi Tzion in Russia. Asher Ginsberg was born to a Ukrainian in, in Ukraine to a Hasidic family. He was married off at the age of 17 to a girl he had never set eyes on until the day of the wedding. Then he was locked into a modest family business for which he exhibited neither enthusiasm nor aptitude. He became an insatiable reader of virtually all European languages. Eventually, he took up residence in, guess where? Odessa, which was a major Jewish intellectual center at that time and a port of departure for Aliyah. And so, quite understandably, upon reaching Odessa, Ginsburg became an active member of the Chovevi I mean, Odessa was their headquarters. So it's a natural, natural connection there. He, he then began to devote his phenomenal scholarship to one cause, the solution of the Jewish problem. Ginsburg wrote under the pen name of Achad Ha'am, one of the people. In 1889, in an article entitled Lo Derek, this is not the way, Achad Ha'am warned his fellow Zionists about the failure of Zionism, Zionism's infiltrationist methods of establishing a Jewish home. You know, a little bit here, a little bit there, infiltrating here and there. He warned that this would be a failure. He insisted that the Jewish national revival in Europe by itself was not capable of supporting a national, a major pioneering uh, effort in the Holy Land. Yes, there was a great Jewish national revival going on in Europe, but that's not going to help in Israel. One course alone was open, Achad Ha'am insisted, that was to mobilize the help of the Western Jews, mobilize this European uh, renaissance of, a, of Jewish life, and organize an international society for rebuilding the Yeshuv. You see, this is where Herzl comes in. The idea of international society for rebuilding the Yeshuv is Asher Ginsburg's idea as well. You know, Herzl will be valuable with this but it is Asher Ginsburg that has come up with it. Only such a body was capable of negotiating a charter of Jewish settlement with the Ottoman Empire, and afterward of buying and preparing land for a systematic and orderly habitation. His purpose was to ensure that the national spirit of the Jewish people was fully ignited. Now the essay aroused widespread resentment among the members of the Chovevi Zion. You know, they thought they were doing fine. Somewhat taken aback by the reaction, Achad Ha'am later modified his views. He proceeded to elaborate upon his conception of the land of Israel as essentially a national spiritual center. 
for the revival of Judaism throughout the world. That was the proper goal of the Zionist movement. His obsession with spiritual and cultural awakening began to have its impact even among the most relentless practical Zionists. Remember, there were two groups, the religious Zionists and the secular Zionists. Were the, they, were, they were the secular, the uh, practical end of, uh, of Zionism. His name, his pen name, soon became the most important in the Zionist world. Chaim Weizmann recalled of him, he had the profoundest effect on the Russian Jewish students in Europe. The appearance of one of Achad Ha'am's articles was always an event of prime importance. He was read and discussed endlessly. He was what Gandhi had been to many Indians, what Mazzini was to Italy a century ago. Ahad Ha'am cultivated the, the a spiritual cultural ideal. And in order to maintain this spiritual cultural ideal, Ahad Ha'am in 1889 founded a select elitist group, the B'nai Moshe, within Choveh B'Tzion. The Society's accomplishments were important. It founded a national land purchasing fund, which later was handed over to the official Jewish National Fund. They published a series of articles, of newsletters, in Jaffa, giving accurate information on the developments within the Yishuv. They established the first Hebrew language school, also in Jaffa, and later a collection of Hebrew libraries throughout the land. They organized the nucleus of secular Hebrew language day schools in Russia, as well as the influential Achiasaf Hebrew language publishing company. The Russian Jewish essayist became the conscience of tens of thousands among the Eastern European Jews who flocked to the Zionist movement. He insisted that political Zionism, far from developing naturally out of Jewish tradition, was hardly more than an artificial concoction of Europeanized Western Jews. From the late 1890s then, Achad Ha'am's campaign against mere political Zionism and Herzl's uh, diplomatic leadership transformed him into one of the most feared and respected critics of, Zion of the Zionist world. So he wasn't all that uh, enthralled with Theodor Herzl either. Achad Ha'am was destined to become the most influ influential of the cultural as distinguished from the political Zionists. Now we come to 1890 and Rehovot and Hadera founded. During the latter part of the 1890s, emigration to Israel slowed to a trickle. The Chovebi Tzion organization remained in the doldrums, denied legal status in Russia, and was unable to collect funds. However, in 1890, the Tsarist regime permitted Chovebi Tzion to begin conducting activities. And from 1890 on, the organization had a permanent office in Odessa. In 1890-91, as a result, 3,000 Russian and Romanian Jewish people departed for Israel. In 1890, the Odessa Committee, as the Chovebi Tzion organization was known to the rest of the Zionist world, the Odessa Committee opened a bureau in Jaffa under the direction of Ziev Tiomkin. Ziev Tiomkin. Unfazed by the Ottoman government restrictions, he managed to purchase, again purchase, several large tracts on behalf of Chovebi Tzion. Here we are, buying our homeland back again. He wrote, resold the land to settlers. In this fashion, two important farm colonies, Rehovot and Chadera, came into Jewish hands outside the influence of the Rothschild administration. Now here's the location of Rehovot on the map of modern Israel. This is Rehovot in its early years. See, the farm has uh, been planted. It's starting to function. Rochavot in 1893, slowly growing. Uh, Rochavot in 1933, starting to look like a, quite a little town, isn't it? Rochavot today, a flourishing town in Israel. Again, another picture of Rochavot, the modern Rochavot. And there's Hadera to the north, and on the coast is the location of Hadera. This is Hadera in 1940. And you can see the Orot Rabin power station today from miles away. These uh, stacks are seen for miles and miles on the coast, so you can easily pinpoint the location of Hadera. And then this is Hadera today. Again, a thriving city in the land of Israel. 
All right, let's do a little theological application. This is not in your notes. This is, ju this is just a little bonus. I won't charge you extra for this. Well, we've seen God lay the foundation of a modern Zionist movement. He used two rabbis, Zvi Hirsch Kalisher and Judah Alkali, to blaze the trail in regards to a new way of thinking. See, there had to be a new way of thinking from a passive view, let's wait for the Messiah, to an active, practical view. We don't have to wait for the Messiah. We can start now to uh, reestablish Israel. Then he raised up the Chobeb groups all over Israel. Interest in Hebrew, interest in Jewish culture, interest in Israel. He raised up men to inspire thought and to produce organization. Moses Hess, uh, Leo Pitzker, Achad Am, William Blackstone. He created others to be pioneers who wanted to be on the cutting edge of the nation, the Bilu, the Biluim. He raised up men and women who struck out into the wilderness with a sheer courage and determination to settle the land, the two waves of the first Aliyah. Now, none of this happened by accident. None of this happened coincidentally. This, none of this happened apart from God's control. He used the people he determined to use whether they trusted in him or not. And the same is true for our lives. God is in charge of our lives as well, each one of us. He brings circumstances and people into our lives in order to guide us, guide us in the direction and to the destiny that he has sovereignly determined for us. He can use anyone, believer or unbeliever alike, to guide the direction of our lives. Our responsibility lies in trusting him and obeying him to the best of our ability. So just as he brought Israel to life again after 1900, 2000 years of desolation, he will bring new life even to our lives. And even if our lives have been desolated as well. But what God can do on a national basis, he can do on a personal basis with you and me. All right, now we come to 1894 and the Dreyfus Affair. He was an exceptionally striking in appearance, with dark burning eyes, chiseled features, and a rich Assyrian beard. His demeanor was consciously aristocratic. His self-assurance was magisterial to the point of arrogance. This was Theodore Herzl. He was born in Budapest in 1860, the son of an affluent banking family. His parents maintained a nominal Jewish alliance, attending the Reformed Temple each week, and observing major Jewish festivals. And here's Herzl as a child with his mother Janet and his sister Pauline. And there's the young Theodore right there. And this is Theodore at age six with his family. There's young six-year-old Theodore Herzl. Herzl underwent a bar mitzvah. He even attended Jewish uh, communal school. Yet his ambitions as well as the ambitions of his family, were to excel in the realm of German culture. So he was an assimilationist. He attended the University of Vienna, enrolling in the Faculty of Law. Receiving his Doctorate of Jurisprudence in 1884, he accepted a quasi-official position with the Ministry of Justice. Virtually every free moment, however, was spent in the writing of plays and literary essays, and before a year had passed, he had abandoned the law entirely. He was a writer at heart. Herzl's chosen medium of expression was the popular literary form that offered commentary on the social and cultural events of the time. Uh, Fuiliton, Fuiliton it was called. And he became an instant success. He was a good writer. In 1887, he took the, an editorial position with a newspaper and, le and later held other senior editorial positions. In 1891, he accepted the envied position of Paris correspondent for Austria's leading newspaper. His wife was the beautiful and wealthy Nuli Nachschauer. She was high strung and unstable. Following the birth of his first two children, she lived in a state of near chronic hysteria. Separations of the couple were frequent. After the birth of their third child, they lived together only intermittently. And here's a picture of Herzl and his three children in 1900. So unfortunately, his marriage was on the rocks as well. Tough family life. Now, Herzl was increasingly preoccupied by the Jewish question. 
During his university days, he had accepted the fashionable liberal view that religious and racial prejudices ultimately would vanish in an enlightened age. Again, that's not understanding the true source of anti-Semitism as spiritual warfare. So he didn't understand the spiritual understanding, under, underpinnings of anti-Semitism. Yet the mounting intensity of nationalist anti-Semitism began to leave its mark. From 1892 on, his columns from Paris devoted increasing attention to anti-Semitism in the French capital. Herzl's despairing preoccupation with the Jewish question predated the Dreyfus affair. However, it was remarkably uh, intensified by the arrest and degradation of that unfortunate French Jewish army captain. Now, Alfred Dreyfus was an assimilated Jew who was falsely accused of spying. Herzl was a reporter who covered his trial. When Dreyfus was found guilty, Herzl wrote of the anti-Semitism of the mob. The bystanders taunted Dreyfus with the shouts of, death to the Jews, death to the Jews. Alfred Dreyfus was humiliated and sent to prison. Later he was exonerated because he was innocent. But he was uh, degraded and um, court-martialed for this, for, this, uh, for this accusation of spying. So this was Herzl's critical moment of recognition. He saw most clearly that assimilation was not the solution to the Jewish question. Religious and racial prejudice would not disappear with the advent of the so-called Enlightened Age. So for the first time in his adult life, he began attending Jewish religious services. Again, this is the first time in his adult life. He even began formulating a Jewish novel that envisioned the revival of the promised land by a suffering race. Sometime in the winter and spring of 1895, the Zionist idea took form in Herzl's mind. He began describing his thoughts on the Jewish question in a notebook. From some time now, I have been engaged in a work of indescribable greatness. It has assumed the aspect of some powerful dream. But days and weeks have passed since it has filled me utterly. It has overflown into my unconscious self. It accompanies me wherever I go. It broods above all prosaic conversion or conversation. Excuse me. It disturbs and intoxicates me. What it will lead to is impossible to surmise as yet but my experience tells me that it is something marvelous, even as a dream, and that I would write it down. Title, The Promised Land. So God is working in his spirit. The Holy Spirit is working in this man's spirit to uh, prepare him for the role that he'll play in Zionism. This is the beginning of Herzl's astounding diary. The opening pages described an electrifying vision that left the author breathless, that possessed him. Walking, standing, lying down in the street at the table at nighttime. I must above all master myself. I believe that for me, life has ceased, ceased and world history begun. The Jewish state is a world necessity. An early chapter of the diary was especially entitled an address to the Rothschilds. Herzl intended to read it, to the banking family assembled in council and if necessary to rework it later into a book. In August of 1895, Herzl consulted Dr. Moritz Guterman, the chief rabbi of Vienna, who, and read him the address to the Rothschilds. The rabbi evidently was moved and suggested that the document be published. Herzl discussed the idea with his friend, Dr. Max Nordau. Nordau was enthralled. Embracing his friend, he cried out, if you are mad, we are mad together, count me in, I am with you. And from then on, Nordau remained Herzl's most intimate collaborator. As Nordau, it was Nordau who proposed at this point that Herzl visit Zangwill, Israel Zangwill, an eminent Anglo-Jewish Anglo novelist, another writer, and a man of considerable reputation among British Jewry. <clears throat> His reception of Herzl's idea was courteous, but generally non-committal. It appears that these two writers did not join forces. Herzl set about pruning, taming, and organizing the notes of his address to the Rothschilds into a formal 65-page essay. And now we come to 1896, where Herzl publishes Der Judenstadt, 
and I see I have just run out of time and so this is a good point to stop so we'll pick it up we'll pick it up um, next session in 1869 as Herzl moves forward and publishes their Judenstadt so thank you so much for being our students I hope this uh, class has uh, inspired and interested you we'll see you next session uh, as we pick up the continuing story of Zionism and the history of the modern state of Israel. Again, thanks for being our students. Lehi throat, lehi throat.